PowerPoint just now. Yeah, it's working now. Yeah. Oh, who knows how to do this PowerPoint? Yeah. I don't know. I thought Ricky had tried to. So, let me be. Thank you, for coming. Thank you so much for coming again for the second seminar. So, yesterday I basically discussed the development of Marx's ecology up until volume 1 of chapter 1867 and how he read Eustace von D.B. in 1864 and he was so inspired and he gave up his earlier productivist understanding of uh, technology and science. He developed this theory of global agriculture in capital. But today I'm going to talk about something after that. So 1868, 1869, so after the publication of Volume 1 of Capital. And interestingly, uh, Marx didn't really write so much. I mean, he didn't publish so much. He wrote many things, but he didn't really publish after Volume 1 of Capital. So in that sense, notebooks are very important. I'm going to talk about notebooks again. But notebooks are all the more important because he didn't publish and he didn't complete volume two and three. So, and it also Engels moved to London. He lived in Manchester, but he came to London. So they stopped corresponding, right? They could just meet up and then discuss issues. So, actually letters are very important to know what Marx was interested in and what he was trying to criticize, etc. But letters will decrease significantly. And he didn't publish, right? So only notebooks can tell us what he was actually trying to do. It's not very explicit, so we have to be very careful. And we have to be uh, very careful about the very small details and the changes of nuances, uh, which I'm going to deal with. So in that way, I think I can show you more clearly why notebooks are important and why the project of the Marx and his examples Mega can be very helpful today to understand Marx in the age of logical crisis. So a little bit of summary of what we discussed yesterday. I think some people weren't here or some people just forgot what they told you yesterday. But in any case, so basically, before year 2000, many people thought that, even Marxists, thought that Marx wasn't very ecological, so his theory is not very useful to understand the ecological crisis. Actually, many people thought that Marx is a productivist, increasing productive forces is always good, and it's also the conditions for social society, and for human emancipation. So people criticize this as Promethean. The Prometheanism is the idea that aims to overcome any natural limit for the sake of human freedom, emancipation. And of course, this kind of way of thinking is incompatible with environmental thought or environmental ethics. Right? They try to emphasize why humans must live in a within certain limits and they have to coexist and co-develop with nature. But Prometheanism is opposite. It's just overcome such limits. So the green always criticizes Marx for being stupid about this Prometheanism. But the situation changed after 2000. Yesterday, as I said, in my previous view, people like Paul Barker and John Bellamy Foster looked at Marx and Engels' text very carefully and found out this concept of metabolic relief based on uh, Marx's reading of Eustace von Liebig's agriculture chemistry, which I discussed yesterday. And the second one is James O'Connor, his famous concept of second contradiction of capitalism. The first contradiction is, of course, the capitalism develops and then the more workers and then by the day they become poor and poor and one day there will be revolution. That's the first contradiction. But the second contradiction is that the capitalism increases productivity more and more, but that undermines its own 
material conditions of production, with the nature deteriorate. So that's the second contribution. Capital. And these are very in two important approaches to Marxist ecology. And actually, however, I want to defend a metabolic lift approach while criticizing uh, second contradiction capitalism approach. And in fact, even the people like O'Connor and Joel Bell, who endorsed this idea of second contradiction capitalism, can be categorized as so called first stage eco socialists. First stage eco socialists, this categorization basically comes from John Dyer. Of course, the, the first stage eco socialists are the ones that try to combine the green and red, so the Marx, they try to ecologize Marx, but in such a way that they also highlight many limits of Marx critique of the For example, labor theory value is anthropocentric, so it's not very useful to think about um, sustainable human nature relationship. And he, they also say that 19th century natural science that Marx was reading and thinking other people are, you know, already out there. We are in the 21st century. So what Marx was reading cannot be really useful anymore. They also say that, OK, there are passages in Capital, Volume 1, from this robbery character of modern agriculture. He talks about lineage, etc. But these are not the main topic in Capital. Understand the So they say that Marx ecology is only a marginal historic topic in his project of critique of political And people like Gold also say the socialism is already dead, so we have to think something else. And the Libyan is much harsher. He says, the general structure, the intellectual scaffolding of Marx's paradigm, along with the key solutions it suggests, must be jetson, abandoned. Virtually every area of Marx's thought must be thoroughly examined in order to really be of use to this issue. Marx as such is no longer very much. So this is a very typical approach of first day But the problem is, of course, when they emphasize so much limitations of Marx, why do we have to read Marx anymore? You know, the labor theory value is wrong. Socialism is already dead, and the you know, theory of class no longer really describes the social society where in which we live, etc., etc. So they cannot really explain anymore why we have to read Marx in order to deal with this ecological crisis. So I think we need another approach which can be categorized as second stage of socialism, basically important one, the poster and the bucket. And they basically try to defend the basic approaches of Marx's critique of political economy. So they try to defend the theory of value, theory of class, theory of re-education, theory of fetishism, anything. They try to defend these key concepts of political economy and to combine or build upon them Marxist ecological critique of capitalism. And so they basically argue that it's possible to develop a systematic critique of political economy and in to include ecology into this critique of political economy. And they basically think that the need is very important and uh, their concepts are pretty much based on this concept of metabolic lift. Uh, but they also expanded beyond to deal with this issue of environmental imperialism, as we saw yesterday, and critique of extractivism. And it, it influences now Klein, for example, and in this case, everything she refers to uh, Marx and Foster at the same time. 
However, as so you know, Foster market become more influential and no Marxist people like now um, Klein uh, starts to employ the concept of metabolic lift. There are more critiques against Foster market. And these are some figures who criticize Marx, Arnold Marx necessarily, but uh, Foster and also Marx to some extent. Tanuro or Engels Saudi Mauro or Jason Bua. And they basically said, you know, Foster and Barget exaggerate too much of Marx's interest in ecology and its systematic character. And they also say it's all by evaluation, the agricultural chemistry. It's 19th century thing, it's not like just few passages and then Foster just Develops like an entire theory of metabolic belief out of two passages. And Tanuro, for example, also says that, you know, in the 19th century, Marx didn't know really the cause of climate change. So his theory cannot be applied to today, because the main problem is climate crisis. But at the time of Marx, it was soil exhaustion, so there's a huge gap. And what Marx was reading is no longer used. That's why I want to come back to notebooks. Because notebooks, these are published for the first time in the Negra. So Foster and Barquette don't know about it. But also the critics of Foster and the Marx ecology don't know about it either. But they contain a lot of materials that deal with natural science, and especially made after 1868, after publication volume one. And it contains agricultural chemistry, Biology, mineralogy, geology, etc. It's very extensive notes. Actually, one third of notebooks, so that in post section of the mega, we have 32 volumes. One third, so it's like almost 10 volumes, are actually notebooks that are made after 1868. And half of it deals with natural science. So a huge chunk of notebooks are made in his late years and that deals with natural science. And I argue that looking at these notebooks, we can actually see the expansion of Marx's ecology in his late years, which also goes beyond the Davis agriculture chemistry. So he Marx didn't absolutize Lee. He read new things he modified his theory, he tried to develop more uh, his critique, ecological critique of that. And also, yes, so they, in this way I try to defend the Marx ecology <coughs> from the recent critiques based by Tanuro and Engel Di Marco. So basically, I'm, in the following, I will look at these notes. And also, okay, let's go back to this famous passage that I uh, dealt with yesterday. In chapter volume one, Marx integrated the league, which is a critique of robbery system. And he said, capitalist mode of production collects the population together in great centers and causes the urban population to achieve an ever growing preponderance. It disturbs the metabolic interaction between man and the earth, i.e., it prevents the return to the soil of its constituent elements consumed by man in the form of food and clothing. Hence, it hinders the operation of the eternal natural condition for the lasting fertility of the soil. And here, I mean, if you were here yesterday, you know, you can clearly see the influence of Mr. Scomili. And this footnote I also read yesterday, but I read, Marx basically very highly uh, spoke of it. To have developed from the point of view of natural science, the negative, disruptive side of modern agriculture is one of these modern merits. And then he even continues in this first edition, his brief comments. And Libby's brief comments contain more flashes of insight than those by modern political economists altogether. Smith, Ricardo, Marcellus, 
and move together, being a little more important. However, actually, he modifies this passage in the second edition of the chapter, published in 1872. He says simply, leaving the brief comments contain flashes of insight. That's it. Mm -hmm. So, the question is, goes, why? You know, and that this change is totally overseen because we usually read only fourth edition of the chapter, right? The one that Engels edited after Marx's death. Mm -hmm. And no one really reads the first edition, and they don't even compare to the second edition. It is only through Mega, the Mega publishes all the editions of chapter that were published while Marx and Engels were alive. So only through this, looking at that volume 2, 5, and 2, 6, which is the first edition and the second edition, you can actually see how Marx tried to change things uh, in this five year. So the question, that, of course, is why did, he, did Marx have to eliminate the passage or the like phrase that goes by the other political comments altogether? So maybe the question, maybe, maybe, you know, he had some doubts. He thought that it's like exaggerated. So he had to secretly correct it, this phrase. And to think about this, you know, we have to be very careful. Because he didn't say anything explicitly. So we have to look at letters and notebooks. And the letter is very helpful because at the time he still writes in English. And one letter dated on January 3rd, 1860. So right after the publication of Volume 1, he says, uh, the Shorema, Shorema is a friend of Engels and Marx, that is his chemist. So he's asking some advice from the expert of chemistry. I would like to know from Shorema what is the latest and the best book in German on agricultural chemistry. Furthermore, what is the present state of the argument between Mineral fertilizer people, maybe, and the nitrogen fertilizer people. And this laws and Gilbert and the British people. They had a debate. And does Schoenemann know anything about the most ger recent Germans who have written against the Levy Soil Social Theory? Does he know anything about aluminum theory or Munich agronomist Fras? So here it clearly shows what Marx was interested in at the time. He is interested in critique against DB, and also the debate that comes from the nitrogen fertilizer people. So he is really, you know, a little bit anxious about it. You know. Okay, maybe in the first edition I spoke very highly of DB, but maybe I was too quickly to make a judgment. Because he didn't have to include this passage on DB, right? He could have waited until volume 3, where he deal with this issue of ground rent. But he was so excited that he added one section in the chapter of the, the large industry, and he added this passage on DB and so on. But he, after he published volume 1, he becomes a little sober, and uh, oh, maybe I made a few hasten judgment. And uh, yeah, going back to Gibi yesterday, I said that the Gibi theory is basically the mineral theory. The inorganic substances is quite essential for plant growth. That's the main contribution of Gibi uh, in the field of chemistry, uh, agricultural chemistry. And he argues that these minerals in the soil is very limited because the weathering takes time, and if humans take too much by agriculture, the land gets exhausted very quickly. So he says, you know, using manure, chemical fertilizer, we have to return those minerals to the soil. And that's he formulated as low replenish. But he, he warned that this is totally ignored by a stupid farmers in Germany or in England uh, for the sake of short term profit, profit making. And he claimed that this is a robbery practice, and this, if this practice continues, 
the entire European civilization collapses because of the soil exhaustion. And at the time, actually, the soil exhaustion was a huge social concern. So, you know, he kind of tried to revive his fame. He was a little bit forgotten in the late 50s, so he came up with this book, the seventh edition of agriculture chemistry. He added this introduction to the volume where he really provocatively warned against the <coughs> social and social issue. And this claim rehabilitated even his fame in the 60s, but at the same time, many people immediately started to criticize this overemphasization. But at the time, when Marx published Volume 1, he didn't pay enough attention to these critics of the So only after publication, so only after 1868, he started to pay more attention to the critics of the theory of soil exhaustion. And not only scientists and farmers took part in the debate, but also the economists were also active, like people, Wilhelm, like Wilhelm Rocha. His book, Nationale Autonomie des Ackerbaues und der Verwandtenproduktion, you know, this was published in 1864. And Marx actually read this book. I mean, I think this is a reason why Marx read Bibi. And in this book, he says, even if many of Bibi's historical assertions are highly disputable, even if he misses some important facts of national economy, the name of this great natural scientist, Bibi, will always maintain a place of honor comparable to the name of Alexander Humo in the history of national economy as well. So, Rocha basically thinks that his contrib contribution to political economy is also very significant. And this is very similar to what Marx said in the first edition. So, Levy was received by many political economists and other than Marx and Rocha, for example, Kerry. Yesterday we saw Kerry and his claims about the irrationality of uh, modern agriculture in North America. And it's very similar to what uh, Levy maintained. So we understand very easily why Kerry and Levy are very close to each other. He said basically that the global evil of the arts is nothing but a crime against future generations. And basically the idea of this, Kerry was criticizing the imperial domination of the Britain in North America. So he was arguing for the protectionism. And it was good. Now, Kerry can use Levy's theory to justify his claim for this protectionist policies and building self-sufficient small-scale town communities where producer and consumer live next to each other and always recycle. Uh, what they have produced and consumed. And in Europe, Eugen Dürer, the German guy in Berlin, integrated Kerry Bibi into his system of political economy. And he became very popular among workers. He says, also soil exhaustion, and it has already become quite threatening in North America, for example, because he was really careful, can be halted in the long run only through a commercial policy built up on the protection and the training of domestic labor. For the harmonious development of various facilities of one nation leads to its own local ethics business, which promotes the natural circulation of materials and makes it possible for plant nutrition taken out from the soil to return to the original soil. So basically, you know, it's very close to what here you need to say. Actually, Marx read during They've been doing Wi-Fi, and it actually is, I think, disrupted rats. Is it rats? I don't know. I mean, I'm it sounds assuming like rats. it yeah. happened. But they've been putting in Wi-Fi in the building. Uh, yeah. I think so. I think it's rats are biting. Yeah. <laughs> I think. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. So Marx was doing the beginning of the and he must have been surprised to find a similarity in the idea. Right? Okay, this is very similar to what Marx also wrote in chapter 41. 
And especially because later, as Dürin became very popular as a kind of social democrat among the workers in Germany, the relationship between Marx and Dürin became quite antagonistic. And so, it's imaginable that Marx also thought that it's necessary to distance himself from Dürin in terms of global agriculture. So he thought that he might have to formulate in another way what he cannot be so explicitly like being his supporter as Oyen Dürin was. And also at the same time, he read other books uh, that are more critical of the people like Albert Friedrich Lange and Julius Au are very critical. I'm not, I don't have time to go into this, but uh, they basically say that this exaggeration of the danger of the modern normally system of agriculture and the market system functions better and so on. And then these are things that Marx was also reading in the year of 1868 and 69, which might have you know, increased his doubt on his own over evaluation of TV in the past edition of capital. But the important one, the most important one, I would say, is Karl Strauss, whose name also appeared in the letter to Karl Schoen about alluvium theory. But he also said that if theory is overemphasized and retreating to the Malthusian theory of absolute overpopulation. And there are actually some passages like this in Nibi where he is quite close to Marx at any He says, for example, in the introduction to agricultural chemistry, in a few years, the Guan reserves will be depleted, and then no scientific or theoretical disputes will be necessary to prove the law of nature, which demands from man that he cares for the preservation of living conditions. For their self-preservation, Nations will be compelled to slaughter and annihilate each other in never ending wars in order to restore an equilibrium. And God forbid, if two years of panic, such as 1816 and 17, succeed each other again, those who survive will see hundreds of thousands perish in the streets. So, this is very nonsensical. As we saw yesterday, <laughs> Marx tried to use the in order to criticize Marxists, but actually maybe it's quite close to Marxists sometimes, so that's also very good. Cool. And Franz was basically criticizing why was Libby so pessimistic? You know, in the 50s, Libby was very optimistic, and he became all of a sudden um, very pessimistic in the 1862. He said, or Franz said, it's because Libichi was so one-sidedly <coughs> dependent on chemical fertilizer. But the chemical fertilizer is very expensive at least at the time, and it had short-term effect, right? So it didn't become very popular at the time. So then if chemical fertilizer doesn't function as a solution, Libichi thinks, oh, there's no more solution. We are over you then because of the soil. But the last thing is that there is another way of sustaining a more uh, sustainable agriculture. And that's the field of alumina. Using the power of nature. It's not the humans take care of sustainability. We, use, we don't have to use chemical fertilizer. We can use the uh, power of nature to make sustainable agriculture possible. And what is alumina? Alumina is like earth, sand, like small stone, and other transported matter which has been washed away and thrown down by rivers, blood and other bodies and for man, not permanently submerged beneath the water, lake and sea. So in the nature you can find the examples of alluvium in sandbank, the Danube, Delta, the Canai, and the Port. You know, these are the places where the agriculture productivity is very high. And Franz is basically suggesting that we can sort of get inspiration and construct an artificial alumina by blocking the river water and then, you know, floating the entire land and so that the minerals contained in river water can be used uh, as a kind of fertilizer in a natural way. So it's free. So this is also cheap and sustainable because river water is always flowing, etc. Et and that's the one critique of uh, chemical fertilizer. 
So what's more interesting is that Flask has another theory. And this is what interests Marx was. There's a one letter where Marx explicitly discusses the importance of Flask. His name doesn't appear in chapter, but only in the letter, unknown books. He says, very interesting is a book by Flask, Kriva and Kutranzender in their site, I mean the Bayer, namely as proving that climate and flora change in historical time. Flask claims that with cultivation, depending on its degree, the moisture so loved by the peatlands gets lost, hence also the plants migrate from south to north, and finally step formation of water. The first effect of cultivation is useful, but finally devastating through deforestation, etc. The conclusion is that cultivation, when it proceeds in natural growth and is not <coughs> consciously controlled, leaves deserts behind it, Persia, Mesopotamia, Greece. So once again, an unconscious socialist tendency. He finds a socialist tendency in Flas. That's very interesting, because Flas was very critical of the English. And still, Marx found socialist tendency. In so here we see that, you know, I think that the Marx found the social tendency first in DB, but now he is finding another one in one of the conscious DB critical class. And what basically Flas said that, you know, the deforestation changes local climate. The excessive deforestation uh, changes the temperature and dryness, the, you know, the temperature becomes higher the air becomes much more dry. So as a result, the plants have to move from south to north or from plains to mountains where the temperature is lower and the humid, humidity is high. This, you know, he reads many books in ancient times and he compares to the present situation and he, you know, he's a very theologist guy. He's a very great, he, this book is really great. It's not available in English. But he really traces the historical movement or changes of plants and uh, kind of Darwinian way. But the problem is, anyway, if the temperature becomes higher and the air becomes more dry, it also causes the significant problem for uh, corn, rice, and wheat, and those basic food that the civilization is dependent on. So the, as civilization develops, uh, deforestation proceeds, this becomes excessive. But in the end, that comes back to humans, because what they have been growing no longer grow in the same land anymore. So that's the ultimate reason why the Mesopotamia, Egypt, and Greece, and those ancient civilizations are no longer flourishing at their craft. So, Libby said it's soil exhaustion, but Flas has another theory, it's deforestation, excessive deforestation is the cause of the ecological crisis. So this is already expansion of Marx's theory. It's very, very new for Marx, but he really found it interesting, and he immediately looked for another literature where the discussion of deforestation and its economic impact uh, can be Observed. Like for example, there's a book by Take in which he also talks about the effect of deforestation. Uh, for example, he says, the indolence of our forefathers appears a subject to be that in neglecting the raising of trees, as well as in many instances causing the destruction of forests without sufficiently replacing them with young plants. This general waste appears to have been the greatest just before the use of sea coal was discovered, when the consumption for the use of forging iron. Because there's nothing to resist a cold wind, cattle fed their own are standing growth. The vegetation has often the appearance of being scorched with fire or heat with stick. So these are passages that must pay attention. This is a very a clear example of the negative impact of deforestation upon cattle and food and the entire economy. But there is also another passage. This time he integrated into 
one manuscript according to Kappa written in uh, 1868 and 1672. Here, Marx makes comments on freely history of the book, hard book that uh, we are chapters in the Greek time. And he says, this is Marx's words, that development of culture, like agriculture and industry in general, has evinced itself in such an energetic destruction of the forest that everything done by it, conversely, for their preservation and the restoration appears implicated. So here, you know, the trees take a lot of time to grow. Many, many years, the decades. But the capital wants to show them that it's turned over. They want to you know, just use those materials as quickly as possible. So the two kinds of time, the time of capital, that must be shortened for the sake of profit and shorter time of the capital. But the nature's time cannot be modified so easily. The productivity can be doubled or tripled in a very short time. But it doesn't mean that the nature can catch up with this pace, right? So this discrepancy of two kinds of time, time uh, Basically, the cause of metabolism is that mm. most of the problem we're talking about. And this is a very interesting fact that, you know, so this is also the example that turnover of capital is shortened that it appears as if the productivity becomes higher, but it's not sustainable. So it's not really development of productive forces, as I discussed yesterday in the discussion time, it's lower. There's a like, stock farm. Marx read Leon's Labelle, Rural Economy in England, Scotland, Ireland. It's a book uh, in which Labelle compares the British uh, agriculture, or like stock farming, and French stock farming. This French. He basically said the British stock farming is much higher, and the French must imitate or learn from British stock farming. And uh, his favorite example is Robert Baker, he's a British reader, and he made this new system of uh, selection and then he really increased the productivity of agriculture production and so on, sheep raising, cow raising. But his comments on this development, the Lapin just praises how they break well, break well with great guy, etc. But Marx says, after quoting many passages from Lapin, he said, characterized by precocity in its entirety, sickliness, Want of bone, a lot of development of fat and flesh, etc. All these are artificial products, disgusting. It's very strong in French, it's disgusting. He writes actually in English, disgusting. And so here he actually thinks that you know, this modification of human, modification of animals by humans for the sake of profitability is something very disgusting. It shouldn't be done. So here Marx actually recognizes intrinsic value of nature and you know he criticizes this instrument instrumentalist attitude towards animals of nature. And here this time he uses another passage in his manuscript of capital. He quotes from William Walter Goods in which he says for this reason Remembering that farming is governed by the principles of political economy, the cows, which used to come south from the dying countries for rearing, are now largely sacrificed at times of a week and ten days old in the shambles of farming of Manchester, Liverpool, and other large neighboring towns. But these little men now say, in reply to recommendation to rear, is, oh yeah, we know very well it would pay to rear the mill, but it would first require us to put our hands in our heart, which we cannot do. And then we should have to wait a long time for a return instead of getting it at once by the way. So here this time it's about the shortening of the production time. And so they just slaughter the very premature cow sheep. But this is not good, right? it's not very rational way. So, according to Marx, this is also not sustainable, thus global. So these are passages that Marx integrates into volume two of chapter. But by looking at both books, one can understand better why he integrates these passages in 
deep discussion of stock duration and capital. And I don't, there are many other notebooks at the time, but I don't have time. And it, also in the 70s, he continued to read uh, similar books. He also reads in 1868 uh, William Jevons' Cold Question, you know, the famous book. I mean, Jevons actually also talks a lot about living. And he applies his theory, like living his theory, to the issue of coal, the exhaustion of coal mining. Marx reads this book, but also he reads many books on climate, you know, the climate and the soil, etc. And also the second one is about lava. It's about global agriculture and the golden mesh of soil exhaustion. These are books that we can find in his library. So after Marx studied so hard these natural science, Engels actually realizes that he knows better than I am. So he actually says in his very, uh, in 1882, so it's almost like the last year of Marx's life, man as a war, man as a worker is not merely a fixer of present solar heat, but a still greater squanderer of past solar heat. The stores of the energy, coal, ores, forests, etc., we succeed in squandering, you know, better than I. So, Engels actually admits that it must be really expert in this field. And so, I can kind of sum up some of the arguments. And here, in this way, Marx really clearly see that the contradictions are emerging out of precisely this development of productive forces, right? But uh, in a way that only globally is becoming more and more apparent, like a dominant tenant. So he thinks that we cannot simply praise the development of productive forces. But in this way, he overcame productivity. And the capital actually finds always a new solution. The soil gets exhausted, they find guano, and you know, the, when the guano gets exhausted, they invented harbor bush, etc. So capital actually develops new technologies, new ways, always to overcome this barrier. So on the one hand, there's always new technological development, new utilities, new commodities, new pesticide, a new chemical fertilizer, but at the same time, the deepening of global practices. Right? So we cannot simply say that one day, you know, because of this ecological crisis, capitalism collapses, as James O'Connor argued with his concept of second contradiction of capital. It's very static, right? because capital always overcomes this ecological crisis in favor of capital accumulation. So we can actually cannot wait until capitalism collapses because of ecological crisis. I think it's too late. Capital can profit from ecological crisis. So it's much earlier that the ecological crisis becomes so grave, not for capitalism, but for humans, or for the human free development. The ecological crisis gets deepened to some extent, and then the free, sustainable human development is no longer possible. But capitalist development is possible. That's the problem. So the second contradiction of capitalism connects ecological crisis and economic crisis, but we cannot wait until these two crises are linked together. Mm -hmm. So the conclusion is that basically looking at notebooks, we can actually learn that Marx ecology expanded even more to different issues of deforestation, stock farming, and etc. etc. after or like the Jebon, the cold question, after 1868, in such a way that relativizes his earlier evaluation of DB. So this is very interesting fact, so you know, the poster that you and the second one is that we can distinguish the globally that is not sustainable, that's just taking what the future generation should get. So this is not real development of productive forces. Real development of productive forces must be also sustainable. 
And his discussion, his letter to Engels about flat, his discussion about unconscious socialist tendency shows that the future society must include the conscious regulation of metabolism to human nature. He says this is conscious social struggle. So in that sense, Marx's socialism is eco-socialism. Because mm. he explicitly thinks that conscious regulation for the sake of sustainable production is essential task for establishing free, sustainable human law. And actually, looking at notebooks, we can also learn that not only Marx, but also many people, Libby, Flas, Jevons, and other people are talking, like Russia, Kerry, there are a lot of people who are talking about the issue of sustainability and environmental destruction in the 19th century. So it's not like I'm you know, living in the 21st century under the climate crisis, so looking at Marx, trying to justify and try to pick up some passages arbitrarily for the sake of using Marx as a political figure. No, it's not. Because already in the 19th century, the ecological issue was always a big concern. And it was almost natural that he was, after reading these things, integrated this ecological aspect into his own political political right? moment. So that's one thing we can Also, Marx's critique of political economy is incomplete. He knew it. He tried to, that's why he always tried to learn new things. He didn't absolutize Libby. So his ecological critique of capitalism is unfortunately incomplete, but also that means he's open to new findings in natural science. It's a, his system is very elastic. He wanted to incorporate flowers, Jewish walls, and gemmons and new people. So we can also update new scientific findings in order to also update Marx's own critique of political economy. And finally, Marx's theory of metabolic belief offers a solid methodological foundation to analyze the ecological crisis as the contradiction of capitalism and imagine a sustainable society beyond capitalism. But this is only possible, I would say, by looking at notebooks and also going beyond what Marx left to us. Thank you.